हेलो गुड डे व्यूअर्स नमस्कार ए गुनशान टू आवर व्यूअर्स इन टर्की वेलकम टू द न्यू शो वी स्टार्टेड ब्रेकिंग ग्राउंड कटिंग एज नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल सिक्योरिटी इश्यूज वी डिस्कस्ड इन ओपन फोरम विद द एक्सपर्ट्स टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इंडिया टर्की रिलेशंस जियोपॉलिटिक्स एज वी नो रिमेन एक्सट्रीमली डायनामिक मोर सो इन द मिडल ईस्ट व्हिच हैज a number of stakeholders with diverse national and international interests india is a very important stakes in the middle east primarily we have 9 million migrants and diaspora in the region our oil and investment flows also come in from the middle east in such a scenario the happenings in the middle east are of great concern to india and the region as we know is known as west asia in this part of the world of late turkey is increasing its aggressive diplomatic and security moves in this region we have seen it indulging in a number of activities across the board be it in syria or even extending to the mera region to the libya this is a development which has not been actually fully studied in india so far and we are hoping to do so today by engaging one of our foremost experts in this field brigadier romel dahia welcome to you sir brigadier dahia has had a very varied experience of tracking global and national security issues he was the he is the former deputy director general of india's premier think tank the idsa he has already also headed the the uh, in the integrated defense staff the net assessment directorate in addition he has also been a defense attache to turkey and all covered much wider region than the nation per se we would like to discuss india turkey relations essentially in five parts in the first part we look at turkey's current regional profile and perspectives in the second part we look at the internal and external dynamics which are leading turkey to take such a role defense capability of course comes an important issue turkey pakistan relations are something which indian observers are watching very closely and finally of course the larger perspective of what this impact this has on india and turkey relations let me start with you sir on the first part turkey's current regional profile and perspectives as i said earlier turkey has been expanding its footprint be it in syria be it in libya now be it in other areas of the middle east azerbaijan armenia conflict turkey had a very major role to play so within this perspective how do you see this expansion of the turkey's role in the region at, as of now thank you so much for having me on the show and uh, you know it's really really with turkey and which is uh, uh, and, uh, and a country which is of great importance to me uh, or great interest to me since uh, i reached there in 1999 ever since then i have followed the country and so things have been the same as they say uh, more the change the more the things change more they remain the same so characteristics that uh, that are uh, signature definition definitions of turkey are its nationalism it's a sense of bravado when things go right and a sense of despondency when things don't go right uh, always trying to uh, sort of figure out as to how it can expand its influence well turkey has passed through certain stages uh, the first stage after its uh, it gains i mean after the ottoman empire uh, was wound up and turkey became a republic in 1923 since then it uh, sort of fashioned itself into a secular republic nationalistic secular republic uh, during uh, ataturk's time uh, unfortunately what happened is that the political instability which is always a work, uh, a work in progress in turkey till now uh, gave rise to uh, certain tendencies which were suppressed initially but which came to the fore uh, because of excesses uh, uh, of the secular establishment because of which in 2000 uh, the secular 
gave rise to an Islamist uh, leaning uh, kind of a regime. Uh, till then, during the sec secular time, Turkey was not very much involved in the Arab politics. It was not so much involved in the OIC politics to the extent that, despite being a part of the OIC right from its beginning, Turkey never put forward its candidate uh, for Secretary General of OIC's post. Uh, this came much later. But after the uh, Erdogan regime came into being, uh, the AKP regime came into being, this regime started off initially to gain more acceptance as a soft Islamist, populist, but nationalistic kind of an organization, which tried to draw uh, strength from nationalist parties in Turkey. Besides that, the marginalized Islamic uh, section of the society, who, because of their uh, progress in business, etc., were raising their political profile. But they're not finding a way to express that. Once Erdogan came, all of these guys flocked to Erdogan's party and they gave him a majority in the parliament. Initially, Erdogan became a liberal Islamist. Since then, he wanted to join the EU and for that, always ready to carry out reforms, not only in its financial markets and economic systems, but also in terms of social uh, chapters and you know how to deal with press uh, and he carried out a large number of uh, you know improvements uh, initially he also tried to make peace with the secular establishment which was basically uh, led by the army the armed forces that is uh, the journalists the judiciary and the academy he tried to manage them all but subsequently what happened is his two colors uh, he started showing his two colors after he established, he won the elections for the second time. After 2007, he literally started clipping the wings of the army. First in the name of EU integration. But ultimately, his aim was that the army should never become a disciple of the British politics. It should never be able to interfere through the post-1945 war the physical coups and then soft coup uh, when they removed Erbakan in 1997. So, he uh, then tried to uh, engage them into certain, I mean, accuse them of certain uh, conspiracies. Um, uh, and, and and large number of military people were jailed. This started happening in 2009, 10. Operations like Sledgehammer and Ergen uh, were the ones in which very senior officers, including the ch former chiefs of the general staff, were arrested. It did. Who was spreading Turkish influence, Turkish nationalistic influence, and ethnic Turkish nationalistic influence through Central Asia and other places? In fact, they had opened a school in Delhi also, near South X, and in, in many other Islamic Muslim countries also. His main motive of Hungary was to, to have coaching schools who prepare students for um, taking exams for the military uh, cadet uh, schools and also universities, etc. Now, many of those people succeeded in their normal time and they entered into government services, etc. And they were lying dogo, they were not uh, you know, creating any mischief for the state or something like that. But he had uh, a cadre of loyal people. Now, Erdogan, as he has been his want of making use of people, when it suits him, and then throwing them away, when it doesn't suit him, he initially incorporated them into his designs of putting the, sec uh, the, the secular establishment down, including the army. And when uh, when the cases against the military personnel started, most of the prosecutors and judges were actually the Fatah Gulen supporters. Uh, it is known by various names, including Hizmet uh, in Turkey, for example. So uh, he did that. But in 2013, when the Gezi moment, in, yeah, before that, what had happened is he had uh, uh, also incorporated a gentleman called uh, Mr. Daudol, Ahmed Daudol, who was a professor in Istanbul. And he had written uh, uh, a seminal book called uh, Turkish Strategic Death. The idea of that, main, main theme of that uh, book was that, you look, Turkey has a latent support base in its old 
intervention focus itself in, in re-establishing those links, not only in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, but also in Bahrain. Right, sir. In Middle East should become an area where Turkey must focus its attention on. And he also uh, gave a call for uh, a slogan called Zero uh, uh, Problems with Its Neighbors. Right. And Turkey actually succeeded in improving relations with all these countries. Right. Um, in fact, to the extent that in 2006, 7, etc., Turkey started dreaming of brokering a deal between Syria and Israel. So uh, Turkey had, had made a place for itself. But then also what was, what was happening is that when it met with this success, it gave a, an idea to Turkey that it can perhaps become more adventurous. So it started uh, dealing with a Muslim Brotherhood in various countries in the region, including in Egypt. Hamas also started becoming a little more aggressive against Israel because probably with initial success, Erdogan got an idea that if he pushed his you know, case higher, he could become a leader of the region. Not realize that Ottomans weren't liked in the Arab world and that uh, Turkey was never considered an Arab state. And the Arabs will not accept Turkey as a leader. So, when they were having a bit of a problem. But right. then, the Arab Spring gave him yes. a little opening where the soft Islamist uh, politics was seen as a model which can probably answer uh, all the problems that were raised by uh, you know the agitators during the Arab Spring. So, therefore, he made a pitch in Tunisia, he made a pitch in Egypt, and once those rulers were removed, then his brand name went up. Thereafter, he has been trying to spread his wings. For example, I've been trying to spread his wing in the Upper Sahel region, Chad, Avri Coast, and other countries. Uh, he has uh, established a military base in Somalia. And uh, after the rift took place between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, etc., he has established a training base, military training base in Qatar. Uh, he has gone into Libya. Syria, as you know, he has lost three operations. Operation Euphrates Sealed, Olive Branch, and, uh, and Peace Spring. So he lost these three operations, and they are still there in, uh, in northern portions of, um, uh, of Syria and yes. also in Italy province. So his, his, his sort of megalomania, probably he started thinking that he can do anything, which also right. resulted in, right. in, in, in right. Eastern Mediterranean. When he yes. started sending his ships to reclaim the territory. Yes. Now, the problem is this the Turkey has some basic marriage problems, which he probably is overlooking, but he's trying to leverage the instability all around Turkey and also instability in the global geopolitics. When, when America has lost quite a lot of ground in the region, everywhere, because of after the Trump presidency. Europe presently is fighting with corona-induced uh, 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 problems. Russia has its own problems. Other neighbors, Iran is in doghouse. Saudi Arabia is struck up in Yemen. So because of this global problems, uh, and generally, uh, he is trying to leverage this instability to Turkey's advantage. Right. right. Now, uh, I think you have very much well highlighted what are the internal dynamics how uh, Recep Erdogan and his, uh, has tried to sort of expand his sphere of influence, firstly internally, in a very, very uh, systematic manner, and in a way that he has been making use of his allies and possibly then discarding them when they've been useful. And thereafter, he has expanded his sphere of influence in the region per se, extending right up to the Mena, Mena Belt. So to do those, so, sir, you know, you should have some sort of a defense and security capability. So what is your uh, assessment? How these uh, uh, Turkish, of course, initially, as we, you have said, that the Turkish armed forces, he had to sort of suppress them and uh, try various, you know, conspiracy theories were floating around. But uh, as a, from the, purely from the point of view of the professional perspective of being able to expand in the region, how do you see the capabilities of the uh, defense capability? And also, I would like to you to uh, briefly cover this defense industry, because this is assuming much importance. now. Yes, sir. Take a minute of telling you as to what are the internal and external drivers for this uh, Turkish aggressiveness or Turkish militarism today. 
the interview drive was basically uh, first is that uh, the Turks are nationalistic in any case. Even during the secular regime, uh, Turks wanted to see their society as a marble and not, not as a mosaic composed of various people. So that is one Turkish way of looking at their society in general. The second is that um, Erdogan wants to suppress his um, opponents at home. And by enhancing the nationalistic agenda or by showing that whatever he is doing, he is doing for Turkey's good name and Turkey's uh, power, etc. He is, uh, first of all, trying to get uh, uh, another party, MHP, uh, led by Devlet Bahacheli and his supporters, who are known as Grey Wolves, into his solid uh, vote bank. Because AKP vote bank has slipped below 40 percent. So in case he wants to have the, uh, the majority, he wants another social group or another political group to join him. So that is one agenda of his, that he wants to, he wants to appear tough and nationalistic so that his vote bank is solidified. That is right. One. The second agenda is that in, in, in October 2023, we have the centenary of establishment of Turkish Republic. Now, he wants to remain at the helm till then in a powerful position to get his name in the history. The third internal dynamics is this, that in respect of what Erdogan has done, and there are, uh, there are quite a lot of achievements to his credit, including the, the, the economic prosperity after 2001 burst, that somehow he wants to overcome Atatur overtake Ataturk's legacy by saying that what Ataturk did was great, but he also lost Turkey's influence in the Treaty of Lausanne in 2003, because of which there are very many islands next to Turkish coast which belong to, uh, to Greece. And therefore, Turkey doesn't have much of a continental shelf. So by going into Eastern Mediterranean, muscling into the Eastern Mediterranean, he wants to prove that what Ataturk lost at the table, Erdogan gained it by his power. So he wants to enhance that agenda. This, uh, these are internal, basically internal agendas. The third problem, fourth problem of uh, fourth internal agenda is this: the Turkish economy is basically fragile, which depends on exports, of course. But more important, most important part of it that is tourism, and tourism is suffering. For the last two years, tourism, is, one and a half years, tourism is suffering. This year, of course, it is against 45 million odd uh, um, uh, sort of tourists that came uh, to Turkey in 2018. Uh, this year, uh, they may not reach six to seven million uh, million uh, tourists, and that means huge, huge loss. Because of which, Turkish uh, um, uh, lira has depreciated by about twenty five percent this year. Any major G twenty economy, uh, no econ uh, no, no uh, currency has lost so much as the Turkish uh, this thing. In fact, at one stage, they lost thirty percent before he sacked his son in law. Uh, uh, in November, uh, from the uh, ministry, uh, finance ministry. So, economy is a huge problem for him. In order to overcome that, he is trying to divert attention elsewhere. So, these are the internal things. Externally, like I said, that external actually uh, old Ottoman glory. We, 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 yeah, we have we have covered the external drivers in fair amount of detail okay, in the fine. previous part. Now, let's come to the military capabilities. You see, uh, during the uh, Cold War. Turkey had the second largest armed forces of the NATO after the United States. And Turkey was holding the southern front of NATO against basically Bulgaria, Romania, Russia, Caucasus. Caucasus was also part of Russia, for, I mean, USSR at that time. So they were holding this, this front. And they were the second largest thing, to the extent that, if you remember, uh, that the, the Jupiter nuclear missiles were also there uh, on, on the European part of Turkey. And uh, as part of the uh, Cuba deal, uh, you know, they were removed thereafter. But ever since then, uh, about uh, about 60 odd uh, uh, nuclear weapons, in fact, 90 odd nuclear weapons are still there at Injirlik Air Base. So, and Injirlik Base is the, is the biggest NATO base. So, first is that um, it has NATO support. NATO elements are also there, and they are part of the NATO elements outside Turkey. Because of which the Turkey's external security is guaranteed to a great extent. But 
Turkey has carried out certain reforms. Turkey has, like I said, had done is also carried out purges. Purges in 2009-10, but the biggest purge he carried out was carried out in 2016, following uh, the coup attempt on 15 July 2016, uh, wherein about 20,600 some uh, um, serving soldiers have been dismissed from service, and many others have been downgraded or retired. Now, in this, what had happened? At least 30 percent of the Air Force pilots uh, were dismissed because the Turkish Air Force, uh, I mean, many planes had uh, taken part in, uh, in this uh, failed coup attempt. As far as uh, uh, Navy was concerned, more than 50 percent of commanders and above, that is the senior officers, were dismissed or put in the jail. So they have they faced huge, huge amount of problems, and. Because the Air Force had become uh, in a way that they did not have enough pilots to fly all the planes, they have close to uh, 300 uh, F-16 planes, for example, and which is one of the most potent air, uh, air forces in the region, that they uh, they have had to have Pakistani um, Air Force pilots placed in Turkey to take care of an emergency in case required they can fly. Those. Now, what has happened is that the Turkish Armed Forces used to have the conscription for most of the people who were conscripted. The period of conscription has been reduced. Number of uh, um, regular volunteer soldiers have increased, but the overall numbers of the arm, army and, and air force and navy have reduced. Now today they have uh, about three lakhs and fifty thousand troops, and almost the same number in reserves. Most of the infantry is the is mechanized. So they don't have real foot infantry except for a division group of troops. All others are mechanized. So they are heavily mechanized. Considering the size of the force, the number of tanks are much larger. The Navy is, uh, the Army is, uh, Air Force, like I said, they have about 300 F 16 planes, plus they have about 80 odd transporters. They have uh, helicopters which are now uh, becoming old, but they have launched their own 129K ADAC uh, helicopters. Um, with the design for Westland um, uh, helicopters, Augusta Westland helicopters. Now, let me go system by system. Army, first of all. Army strength of about 2,000, uh, 270,000. Uh, mostly uh, mechanized. Uh, good uh, support from the Turkish industry to equip them with. Uh, um, self propelled artillery is called Fertina, for example. They have um, um, enough artillery, um, 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 the towed artillery. Uh, they have uh, good ammunition factories uh, which prepare uh, ammunition locally. In fact, uh, in certain uh, things, they are very good. For example, uh, they, one of the factories called Rocket Sun prepares, uh, you, you, you know, those uh, cruise missiles. Factories like SL Sun, which is very good in electronics. Similarly, other factories uh, they have uh, now started making their own armored cars, which they are exporting uh, globally. Drones is the, the the largest industry that has started now, and uh, in fact, uh, this also a, um, a part of a problem with them because the Turkish aircraft industries and they have the private zone, which belongs to his uh, son -in family, uh, Albayra family. Uh, which makes Pyrektar uh, uh, sort of uh, drones and now making Pyrektar Akinji, which is a much, much more powerful um, uh, drones. So that they have. For a very long time, they started off with this under secretary of, of, of Turkish defense industry. This has been uh, always been headed by eminent scientists and not by military people. And they have um, absorbed that have been coming from their countries, and there is from that. They have also been in touch with uh, China, for example, for the, one of the rough rockets. They have been in touch with Pakistan, which will come subsequently. So the defense industry is fairly advanced. Uh, but at the same time, they have critical problems. These two critical problems, let me uh, cite three critical problems that have come, come up recently. This Altai tank project. This Altai tank project was started in 
project has been there on the chessboard for 20 years now, but it hasn't made much headway. Uh, recently, the factory itself has been uh, sold to a consortium of Qatari and, uh, and, and Turkish businessmen, a private factory called SMB, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, they will take quite a lot of time to develop an engine and things like this. Another was the ATAC uh, helicopters. Which they, they had contracted 30 helicopters to be sold to Pakistan, but they can't sell it now because Americans are not giving them engine. Rolls Royce and, uh, was preparing that engine, but they can't. Anywhere. They were giving that engine, they have issues. Now, drones, for example, are getting the optics and communication technology from Canada. And after the Azerbaijan uh, Armenia conflict, uh, they have stopped giving that. So they do face critical problems. But yes. At the same time, they are advanced enough now to, uh, so to produce their own after some delay. But as far as the total forces, the Navy, for example, Navy started off with um, uh, Miljem uh, 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 sort of type of uh, uh, frigates and corvettes, etc. This is with uh, in collaboration with the Spanish company Navenia. Uh, and they have uh, now signed a deal for uh, manufacturing four of them for Pakistan, two in Turkey, two in Karachi. They have 14 of uh, Type 209 uh, submarines. Many of them are getting old because the, the, the first one came in 1980. So many of them are getting old. So they have started off with uh, 214 uh, series of uh, uh, air independent propulsion uh, capability uh, included in that. They have started now manufacturing those. Those this will come up on the scanner. Now, so Navy is quite all right. Uh, and that's it. Navy being strong enough has made it possible for them to reach up to Libya. And also, uh, you know, their survey ships, etc., are guarded by Turks, and they are in a position to challenge even uh, even the French um, uh, ships, etc., when they come there. Uh, the Navy also gives them the capability uh, to hold uh, to carry out a blocking action. So Navy is good. Air force is capable, uh, and, and army, uh, as far as army is concerned, the army has always been. Army was always known to have lots of resilience. They, as and when they suffered casualties at the hand of PKK, etc., they hit back very strongly. Right. Sir. They also shown that that despite right. the, despite the uh, lower morale of the yes. sectors, etc., they have still been able to perform reasonably well in Syria. Reasonably now, well. I think you have covered a really a very excellent review of the military capabilities, which has enabled them to sort of. Uh, no, carry out these various actions which you identified in Syria and including reaching up to Libya uh, with the Navy being so, you know, uh, providing the support role. Now, importantly, you also mentioned that uh, there are some, uh, they had to call up some Pakistani pilots to sort of ban their, you know, uh, Air Force, uh, F-16 and various other aircraft. So that brings us uh, to the next part, that is uh, the, Indo the Pakistan and Turkey relations. How do you view that? And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's going to be an Indian perspective from which we are viewing it. But in general, how do you view the uh, Pakistan and Turkey relations, especially with Mr. Imran Khan? Uh, every time he makes uh, some geopolitical reference, he includes Turkey in the whole paradigm. Sir. You see, um, let me be as objective as uh, I can in this. First of all, look at the historical part. Uh, the Mughals that who came to India uh, came from Central Asia, which et were ethnically Turks. So the Turks see that, see the Mughals as, as Turks, basically. The Pakistanis claim themselves to be a follower state of Mughals in some ways, to say that you know the, they came from they came from the same stock, so to say. So that is one. Secondly, the Khilafat movement. When Turkey decided to abolish caliphate in 2004, in, in, in 1924, when Ataturk abolished caliphate, uh, from India, uh, a, 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 a protest movement started, which was called Khilafat movement, which was not to remove caliphate. They're not going to remove caliphate, and so therefore there was a Turkey connection because many Muslims in India considered Turkey. As, as the place where, you know, uh, uh, the Islam's political box was. So there was a certain kind of romanticism there. And the caliphate movement itself. Now, Ataturk and his secular followers did not openly like it. 
But frankly speaking, deep down, it does get it. Because it does work. So if it is, it is something you know, which gives them a leg up every way. And, and, and they, the Ottoman Empire, glory of Ottoman Empire and Caliphate, they saw it as, as, as one of the same thing. So that was another thing which, although Mahatma Gandhi understanding that in order to keep the unity in the Congress, he had to support the Caliphate. He didn't probably like it, but he followed it. But as far as the Turks are concerned, they see this as a Pakistani. Second, even during the the, the in, in 1914 15 uh, 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 when when the war, war took, was taking taking place in 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 Serbia etc in this area of you know Balkans that time also India had Indian Muslims led by mainly Muslims had collected a lot of money and sent doctors etc for the help of uh, the Turkish army who was fighting in Balkans. So Turks again see that as the Muslims and Pakistan is successful state of that helping Turks when they needed need, need it. So that was the basis of some kind of a connect. But the, the, in real time, the things started with Baghdad Pact, which got converted into Sento, where both Turkey and Pakistan were members along with Iraq. Then started with ECO, Economic Cooperation Organization, which consisted of eight states, which is the same state which became a D8, which has Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, and Turkey as members, which is called D8. So uh, they became members there. So therefore, there has been an ongoing connect between Pakistan and, uh, okay. and Turkey. Culturally also, if you see recently, you know, this uh, uh, Turkish serial Erdogan, uh, which you know highlights how the Ottoman Empire got established and all that was dubbed into in, in Urdu, and uh, Imran Khan himself uh, recommended it to the people to watch it and all that. So there is now today the Pakistani celebrities go to Turkey for holidays, like the Indian celebrities go to Maldives. It's the same kind of a connect that has taken place. And I remember a, a cryptic remark made by a naval officer. I was going to meet the chief of naval staff when I was in Turkey that time. I said, uh, when do you think uh, Turkey and India relations will, will become closer? His one main answer is, was that when India-Pakistan relations improve. And that has been actually the crux. I saw that despite all things, despite Pakistan being accused of, uh, of uh, and rightly so, uh, of terrorism being sponsored from its soil and all that, Turkey has always been a friend. Even in 65 and 71 war, they tried to help them in any way that they could. Uh, the relationship is not only at military levels. In military levels, the relationship is similar as we have with Nepal, that all uh, heads of services in, uh, in Pakistan are uh, um, awarded medals by Turkey and vice versa. So although the military connect has gone down a little bit now after, uh, uh, after Erdogan sacked his military commanders there, and in military role came down, whereas in Pakistan the role has only gone up. But uh, despite that, uh, the relationship continues. And you remember in 2001, when there was a massive earthquake in Turkey, uh, Nawaz Sharif himself had led two C-130 planes full of relief material, and he had gone and handed them over at Ankara Airport himself. I mean, he had gone into the aircraft himself. Now, that's the kind of things uh, that they, they have the kind of relationship they have. Large number of uh, Pakistani students study not only in Turkey, but also in Northern Cyprus, which is Correct. called which Turkey calls Turkey, it's not of Northern Cyprus, but everybody else otherwise uh, calls it a renegade brigade, a renegade uh, province of Cyprus. So, now, so that is the kind of relationship. Correct. Yes. Pakistan economy, their, their trade relationships have always suffered. They have tried to set their higher, sort of a target of 5 million dollars by 2020 and all that, but it has never so far crossed 900 million dollars a year. That's a, that's a great weakness. As compared to that, in 2018, for example, India's trade with Turkey was 8.7 billion dollars. 
Lastly, it came down to seven point eight billion dollars, but in two thousand eighteen was the highest eight point seven billion dollars. So ten times more than the Pakistan strength. Now uh, there have been a couple of deals, like I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Million uh, gates, four of them uh, corvettes, which are, uh, they contracted thirty of these attack helicopters. Uh, in the past, uh, Turkey is known to have uh, uh, supported modernization of F sixteen aircraft here. Turkey also gave frequency hopping sets way back in 1998-1999 to Pakistan. When we didn't have frequency hopping sets, they had received it from uh, Israel. The technology they received from Israel, and after that, they passed on to Pakistan. The, the, the states and many other things. Now, uh, and there are a lot of exercises that keep taking place, and in in access, local exercises also. Pakistani pilots go and take part, for example, or Pakistani naval uh, I mean, sailors go and take part. So there. At military level, also there is uh, in all three services. Right, sir. Right. So there is a very close relationship, undoubtedly, right. and this close relationship has also come into uh, being in 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 in, uh, in Erdogan's support to Kashmir uh, issue. Right. It's also partly because we had in the past supported uh, uh, Cyprus and Greece uh, in, in the conflict, but but more importantly, I think it is it is Erdogan's desire to project himself as a leader of the Islamic world. Uh, I think that is more important than that. And then the last point I must say is this: there are suspicions, strong suspicions, amongst the people who know these relationships that Turkey is probably is looking for nuclear assurance from Pakistan. That should Saudi Arabia. And or Iran go nuclear at some stage, Turkey will get all the support from Pakistan to go nuclear itself. Right, sir. So I think that's a very important point you flagged because nuclear means a very deep strategic relations, and which has been, I think, very intensively developed over the years. Historically, also, uh, you have given a very good uh, review of that. Now, coming on to the last segment, sir, I think uh, India-Turkey relations. As you highlighted, uh, India-Turkey economic relations are uh, quite uh, strong in the sense that we have a trade of uh, seven to eight billion U.S. dollars, which is, I think, quite a large uh, uh, sum from a country which uh, India may not feel is as close to us as 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 the per public perception goes. And of course, there are many other tracks and there are many other linkages between India and Turkey. So, what is your uh, perspective given the current developments, ongoing uh, situations uh, on the India-Turkey relations, particularly with relations to what is going to be the future perspective, sir. Uh, you see, India and Turkey have actually they've had a kind of a love and hate relationship. Uh, many a time, in many phases, the secularism of both the countries, for example, non-alignment, etc. Despite Turkey being part of NATO, etc., Turkey had also, uh, you know were fascinated with uh, India. I remember uh, listening to a speech by um, the then Turkish uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Kulat Rizmi, sometime in 2001, when he was releasing his, uh, the, the, his translated uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Gitanjali, which he had translated in, 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 in Turkish. He himself had translated. So he was releasing that at that time. He says, uh, uh, it's a wonder for the world to see that India with so much of diversity succeeding as a democracy. So somewhere deep down, uh, he also knew that Turkish uh, democracy wasn't perfect democracy. It was always circumscribed by military intervention. So there was a fascination for India. And let me just take three names of Indian diplomats there. One was Mr. Haksar. Second was Mr. K.R. Narayan. And third was Mr. Kamal Sebal. Now, in between others, also they were they were uh, very no, well known name in recent times. Mr. Jassal, who died in uh, in Seattle, uh, was also a brilliant um, diplomat. So, he has had some good diplomats also. Yes. So, he gave that diplomats always. Now, Turkey on the other hand has the probably seen its relations always uh, through the prism of Pakistan, and that's the unfortunate part of it. Although Turkey has also known one thing that. Uh, uh, the economic relation, the future uh, of, of India-Turkish relationship is, is through economy. And so therefore, they have not been nasty on economics. In fact, the Indian, uh, India enjoys a favorable trade balance against Turkey. 
and that probably gives a leverage to them to say that india will not cut off its trade relations with turkey because it enjoys a surplus you know many you can see many tractors from mahindras and tfe uh, you know in turkish fields for example tatas have an office wipro has an office um, many other you know companies have offices there indorama synthetics pojloy and many others in istanbul there is a very large number Uh, as far as politically, uh, relationship are concerned, uh, from time to time they have been bursts of, you know, good relations. Um, uh, Mr. Bajpayee's visit to that place, Erdogan has been to India twice. Mr. Modi had been there once, although not on a bilateral visit, it was part of G20 kind of a visit. Uh, our uh, vice presidents, presidents have been going there. Uh, but overall, I think the, the, that warmth, people to people warmth, and all that hasn't been there. Uh, We have large number of tourists from India have been flocking to, uh, you know, Istanbul, Medsin, Izmir, and Cappadocia. But uh, I think uh, people can always see a difference between, you know, India and Pakistan. For example, uh, when you go to a shop and if a, uh, if a shopkeeper says, "Are you from Pakistan?" for example, so that by itself shows that where, where the where the affection of the people lie. So our relationship with Turkey. Are good enough from the point of view of trade. Politically, presently, they are in a very poor state, to the extent that for the first time in 2019, after uh, Erdogan's ill-advised comments on uh, on on, on uh, Jammu and Kashmir in the UN General Assembly, we had to criticize their their actions in northern Syria. Uh, you know, Operation Peace Spring. We had to criticize that. Uh, we had also uh, then prime minister also had to meet uh, armenian um, prime minister and uh, the the cyprus president uh, in new york to uh, show his uh, anger or the power of his pleasure at at that one uh, or stepping you know uh, diplomatic uh, decencies um, i do not think the relations are going to come back very well quickly but i also don't think that we should lose hope because uh, i think erdogan is reaching His culmination point, so to say, is becoming extremely unpopular. There were recent reports to say that some Turkish uh, uh, paramilitaries, uh, you know, uh, which are outside the state, uh, states, you know, uh, official control, uh, something like Sadat AS uh, International Consultancy, um, some other like uh, Ottoman Hearts, uh, offshoots of Ottoman Germany. this kind of uh, you know uh, kind of uh, quasi military and paramilitary kind of uh, organization which are directly controlled by the presidents in one case by president's son bilal uh, who was also uh, accused incidentally of uh, siphoning of uh, isi uh, is isis uh, oil well uh, he was a conduit for that which which russia of course stopped in 2015 after their uh, their, their jet was downed by uh, turkish air defense so now there are reports that they are encouraging uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, indian youth to go and study in um, turkey also try to uh, and somebody had gone to the extent of saying that they are ready to train indian uh, you know uh, so called mujahideen uh, so they had tried to say that but i don't think uh, uh, turkey will go to that extent because uh, you know it, it 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 can play both ways after all uh, kurds are uh, Are, are a sensitive subject for Turkey, and, and, and one can one can play that game from either side. I don't yeah. think they will do that, but political support to Pakistan will continue, even right. if it's a losing proposition. Very nice. Right. So I think, sir, you have really covered uh, the entire spectrum of uh, Turkey's present profile in the Middle East, the background, the reason for that, and how it's going to progress further, and importantly, Turkey-Pakistan relations, and finally, of course, the India-Pakistan, India and Turkey relations. how they are going to progress ahead uh, the economic sphere as you very correctly highlighted will remain the primary one politically possibly the ups and downs are continue presently we are we are in down phase and importantly that question mark of turkey trying to sort of export you know militias into the kashmir sphere i think that possibility has uh, is not as much as one feels or hears in the media thank you very much brigadier dahiya for this uh, very uh, excellent perspective on india turkey relations and we look forward to you joining us 
in further discussions in the days and years ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you.